We'd like to welcome you to our program. This is part 50 in our continuing study of the wonderful book of Revelation. I'd like to welcome each and every listener to our broadcast this day. We're currently looking in Revelation chapter 14 at three angels' messages that by how people respond to these messages will determine their eternal destiny. And obviously the core person in these three angels' messages is Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ who died that we might be redeemed from our sins. Before we pick up our study today and look at a most striking statement in the Bible, let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this wonderful book of Revelation. We pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us, to help us understand what the Bible says. Teach us, Father, because we need your guidance and your wisdom. And we thank you for the wonderful promise, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We've been looking at the three angels' messages in quite detail, and we're going to continue in that same vein over the next many broadcasts together. Finally, ending up, of course, in Revelation 14, 9, with that famous passage in reference to the beast and his image and receiving his mark in his forehead or in his hand. That, of course, is one of the most shocking and most misunderstood passages in all the Bible today. We're going to get to that soon. But right now, we're still in Revelation 14 and verse 7. And this one is going to take us several broadcasts to analyze. We're looking at the phrase in Revelation 14 and verse 7 that says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of his judgment is come. That's exactly what we're looking at right now, is the hour of his judgment is come. Now there's several things that we can learn just by looking at that phrase. Number one, it uses the word hour. And when you and I think of an hour, we obviously think of a clock and time. So somewhere in the Bible, there are prophecies, time prophecies, that will reveal the very time in which the judgment would begin. Oh yes, we're going to study that and we're going to see that. In fact, if you would quickly turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 7, we'll read just one passage. <coughs> Excuse me. Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. It says, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Now, very interesting, the books of Daniel and Revelation go together like a hand to a glove. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10 also talks about a, a, a moment in earth's history when the judgment would begin in the courts of heaven and the books would be opened. We're going to go back to Daniel chapter 7, 8, and 9 in the weeks ahead. Stay tuned. But going back, to Revelation 14 and verse 7. There's a time prophecy that is connected to the judgment event. So we know that we're going to be studying some time prophecies in relationship to Revelation 14 and verse 7. Now it also says the hour of his judgment is come. So this judgment time in heaven it would begin and it would take place. Now, I want you to listen to this very carefully. This judgment will take place before, before the second coming of Christ. 
You say, now wait a minute, Bill. I've I've always heard about the judgment, but the judgment's when Jesus comes. No, it's not. The Bible makes it clear that this judgment in Revelation 14 and verse 7 takes place before the second coming of Christ. And I want to prove that to you right now. If you notice Revelation 14 and verse 7, it takes place before Revelation 14 verses 14 through 16. And in Revelation 14 verses 14 through 16, we read these words, And I looked and behold a white cloud, And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Now who is the Son of Man? Who is the Son of Man? We find that word, that phrase used throughout the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Son of Man was Jesus Christ. So here we have Jesus Christ having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now we find here in Revelation 14, verses 14 through 16, a harvest scene. Now, according to the Bible, we've looked at this already, but let's look at it again. When does the harvest take place? In Matthew 13, verses 39 to 41, Jesus declared. Notice what the Bible says. We're not dealing here, folks, with guesswork. We're dealing with our eternity And so we want to know exactly what the Bible is teaching. We don't want to say, oh, well, I think it means this or it might mean that. No, we want to know for sure. We want to plant our beliefs on the Bible and the Bible only. You say, oh, well, Bill, it's your interpretation of the Bible. Watch how it works. What is a harvest? What does that harvest mean? In Revelation 14, verses 14 through 16, verses 39 through 41 of Matthew 13 tells us what the harvest is. Notice, the enemy that sowed them, that sowed the tares, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. What the picture that we have in Revelation 14, 14 through 16, based on what Jesus just said in Matthew chapter 13, The harvest is the end of the world. And the angels will be the reapers that will gather into Christ's kingdom. When Jesus comes, He will take back to heaven those who have been faithful to Him down through the ages. Those who have honored His commandments and lived up to all the light that they had. So the harvest of Revelation 14 is the end of the world. It is the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is the end of the age. It's the end of 6,000 years of sin and heartache and hardship. Jesus is coming and will take us back to heaven. So the harvest of Revelation 14 is the second coming of Christ. The judgment and these three angels' messages take place before Jesus comes. So this judgment in Revelation 14 and verse 7 is a pre-advent judgment. It's also an investigative judgment. Because as we found in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10, books will be opened. Now, we'll analyze that a little bit later in detail. But in any judgment, 
there is always an investigation to find out who is entitled to the benefits and who is going to inherit the reward and who also is going to suffer consequences for wrongdoing. So this judgment takes place down towards the end of verse history before the second coming of Christ. Now, let me show you a few other passages that make this even clearer to our minds. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, the Bible says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, verse 13, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now, who was it that was speaking here that called himself the Alpha and the Omega? Who was the one who said that when I come, I will bring my reward with me? Verse 16 of Revelation 22 tells us, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. So it's Jesus Christ who is coming and he says, When I come, I will bring my rewards with me. In order for Jesus to bring rewards for those who have been faithful, he will also bring judgments upon those who have been unfaithful. And the only way that the onlooking universe could look upon Jesus and upon his Father and to say it's absolutely fair and just for you to give out rewards at your coming and to, defi- to divide the wheat and the tares at the second coming of Christ. The only way that could be possibly fair is if a judgment has taken place prior to Jesus' coming. And a declaration has been established in heaven as to who has been faithful and who has not. So this declaration of Christ in Revelation 22 and verse 12 can only be fairly, justly made because a judgment has already taken place in the courts of heaven. One other passage, Jesus himself, Matthew chapter 16, stated these words. Verse 27 of Matthew 16, Jesus said, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Once again, Jesus, Matthew chapter 16, makes it very clear that in the time when he comes, that he will come with rewards for those who have been faithful to him. And he will come with judgments and consequences upon those who have not been faithful. You know, some people have looked at that over the years and said, Oh, God is so mean. He's so unfair. He's so angry at the people he's made. These judgments... And these rewards that Jesus will hand out at his coming will be based on the decisions that you and I have made. Our responses to the everlasting mercy of God. How are you responding today to the pleadings, to the entreaties of the Spirit of God? Are you running from the God of the universe? Are you hiding? Are you saying in your heart there is no God? Are you hiding away and not spending time with God on a daily basis? Oh, friends, God loves you today. God sent His only begotten Son when we were in sin when we were running away, when we were ungodly and impure and immoral, God was running after you. 
God loves you. He sent His Son to die for you that you might be saved from your sins. God loves us today. God longs to save us today. And He extends His everlasting mercy to us just now. By how we respond to the pleadings of God through His servants, through nature, through the Bible, through friends, through the tender pleadings of that still small voice, by how we respond, will determine our destiny. So the Bible is very clear that when Jesus comes, He comes with rewards that are based on decisions that have been made in this pre-Advent investigative judgment of Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. Now it's very interesting in the Bible we find that the ancient Israelites as they came out of the land of Egypt they were in absolute heathenism and Moses the prophet of God along with Aaron tried to bring them to Christ. And in many ways God tried to speak to them. In one way God tried to do it was through some feasts that he set apart and these feasts were designed to help the Jews to understand the works of Christ. In fact, in Colossians chapter 2, we find a very misunderstood passage where the Apostle Paul talks about the various feasts of the Jews and says these were all shadows pointing forward to Christ. Verse 16 of Colossians chapter 2 and 17, the Apostle Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. You say, now wait a minute, Bill, I'm, I'm getting lost here for a moment. You were talking about the judgment in Revelation 14 and verse 7, and the harvest, which was the second coming of Christ in Revelation 14, 14 to 16. And now you're talking about Jewish feast days. Well, you know what? In the Jewish feast days, they had two feasts that were designed to teach them about the investigative judgment and the second coming of Christ. And what I'm trying to help you understand here in Colossians 2 is the Apostle Paul was relating to the church at Colossae that all of the ceremonial Sabbath feast days of the Jews were pointing forward to things that Jesus would do in his work for us. If you go back now in Leviticus chapter 23 we find two feasts of the Jews. One was the day of atonement. It was also a day of judgment. And then right after the day of atonement or day of judgment there was another feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles was highlighted or honored five days after the Day of Atonement. And it was honored because the children of Israel had brought in, gathered up all of their harvest for that year. And so the Feast of Tabernacles was a feast of harvest. And I want to show that to you in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 26. The Lord spake to Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do no work in that same day, for it's a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. 
And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. So the day of atonement that took place towards the end of the Jewish religious year, it was a day of reconciliation. It was a day of at one with God. A day of complete and total reconciliation with their Maker. But it was also, as you notice there, a day of judgment. Because if anybody was not afflicting their souls on the Day of Atonement, they were cut off from the people of Israel. In fact, God was even more strong in His language in verse 30 when it says, If anybody is found working that day, that same soul will I destroy from among my people. So the Day of Atonement was also a day of judgment. So in ancient Israel, through the Day of Atonement services or the Day of Judgment services, the people were reminded that somewhere down at the end of earth's history, somewhere down towards the very end of time, there would be a great final investigative judgment, a Day of Atonement that would take place not here on earth, but in heaven. So the Israelites had in their feast days a day of atonement or a day of judgment. And just as we saw in Revelation 14, this day of atonement or day of judgment took place just prior to the final harvest. If you look now in Leviticus 23, verse 34 We read these words, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. Well, the day of atonement took place on the tenth day of the seventh month. The feast of tabernacles took place five days later. So, you go on down to verse 39, and it says, In the fifteenth day of the seventh month, talking about the feast of tabernacles, When ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. That's very interesting that the Feast of Tabernacles, once again, was a feast of rejoicing over the abundant harvest that God had blessed the people with. And so the Feast of Tabernacles was a feast of harvest. And this harvest seen in the Feast of Tabernacles is the very same harvest we saw in Matthew chapter 13. And it's the very same one we saw again in Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 through 16. So the Israelites in the Old Testament were taught through these feasts to see that someday there would be a final end-time judgment, and following that, Jesus would come. Now, we've noticed several things so far. Number one, we have noticed that this Day of Atonement is also a day of judgment. So in Revelation 14 then, verse 7, when it says the hour of his judgment is come, we could also put in there for the hour of the day of atonement is come. Because we find that the terms day of atonement and day of judgment are synonymous in the scriptures. The day of atonement, the day of judgment to the people of Israel was the exact same thing. You were either at one with God on the Day of Atonement or you were judged and cut off from God on that Day of Atonement. Now, are there specific things that were outlined in the Scriptures as to what went on on this Day of Atonement? Yes, there is. We find that chapter in Leviticus, chapter 16. Now, some of you may be saying, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. The atonement, Romans chapter 5 says, 
that it happened at the cross. That reconciliation happened at Calvary. Romans chapter 5, verse 11, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Oh yes. A part of the atonement process was, fit, was done at Calvary. That was part of the atoning process. There are various aspects to atonement in the Bible that we need to take a look at. Leviticus chapter 16 will give us many insights into that. Leviticus chapter 4 will also give us many insights into the full atonement process that we find in the Bible. Let's take a look very quickly in Leviticus chapter 4, verses 27 through 31. The Bible says, If any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty, or if his sin which he has sinned come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, for his sin which he has sinned. Of course, those offerings pointed forward to Christ. He shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. That points to Jesus' death. The priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. He shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. I want you to notice there were many aspects that brought about the completion of the atonement process. When the animal was sacrificed in the ancient Hebrew sanctuary, that did not bring atonement. Atonement only took place when the blood was applied by the priest. So the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, as great and glorious and wonderful as it was, Jesus had to take that blood that he shed at Calvary and he had to minister it in the sanctuary in the sky. We're running out of time. Let us pray. And we'll pick this up in our next broadcast together. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we rejoice today in the sacrifice that was made for us. We rejoice today in Jesus ministering in the courts of heaven. Help us to analyze and make our lives right with Thee in this hour of Your judgment. In Jesus' name, Amen.